The political and religious views contained in these videos represent my own views as an American citizen, whereby I have not originated nor imposed my own private opinions onto my church. Therefore, I have not cooperated with my church to publish them. If they ring true, they must stand on their own. DNA testing of mummies has just been completed. The first ever genetic analysis of mummies found that ancient Egyptian kings were more closely related to Western Asians than Africans, according to the study. So genetic testing could show little or no genetic links to Africa often found in modern Egyptians today. And while our grandfather Joseph claimed Israel as his homeland, his wife, our grandmother, Asena, was not only Egyptian, but a daughter of an Egyptian priest. Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph, then were both half Egyptian. So since the Nephites descended from this family apart from the tribe of Israel, there's no way of knowing what this original DNA looked like. So Lehi's family represents a very small group of people who migrated to a very, very small place in America, likely a few hundred miles each direction. But the identifying essence of the tribe of Joseph is just like Joseph himself. He's missing. He's gone. The cities in the Book of Mormon show up in all the right places, but their history, their language, their roots, everything about them is gone. Is this not why Satan wanted every one of the Nephites killed in the Book of Mormon? He did not want one trace of this tribe left. Not even the DNA. Of course, critics of the LDS Church today declare that no Jewish DNA exists in the modern Indian population. They say the DNA resembles Asians. Well, Joseph was not of the tribe of Judah anyway. Could Joseph's wife in Egypt have been of the same DNA as the Egyptian kings found and discovered in the mummies today? Even at that, DNA evidence research into ancestry is very problematic. And the best geneticists do not place a lot of confidence in ancient DNA verification. In other words, anti-Mormons are not only overstating DNA facts, they are misquoting and actually lying about what the experts are actually saying. The American Journal of Human Genetics recently using the Y chromosome test used the genealogy from populations from Iceland. In other words, the majority of people now living in Iceland had ancestors living only 150 years ago who could not be detected or matched with the current Icelanders today. Yet their genealogy proves them to be real ancestors. So if ancestors living only 150 years ago cannot be linked, then how could Book of Mormon ancestors living 2,500 years ago match up today? So this is where the scholar Dan Peterson has a great big laugh. He talks about these anti-Mormons who think the church is now on life support over DNA, and they're about ready to pull the plug. You know, the anti-Mormons say the same test that proves a criminal murdered somebody in court is the very same test that proves that the Book of Mormon is not true. That is so simplistic and wrong that it's laughable. Most people are under the opinion that DNA testing today is quite advanced in criminal cases and personal identity. However, DNA ancient population tests are far from conclusive yet and are currently at the beginning stages of knowing all of the complexities that can occur when many races are mixed together over hundreds and thousands of years and how to determine how time alters and completely changes the genetic drift away from the DNA's original identity. Joseph in Egypt being married to an Egyptian bride whose DNA was Asian as discovered in the Egyptian mummies, could rule out any argument about there ever being a fully Israelite DNA line in America. However, we still find and have found a small infusion of Middle Eastern DNA called Middle Eastern Hopla Group X, which recently opens up the possibility that the tribe of Joseph did migrate here. And of course, once again, the anti-Mormons are keeping very, very quiet about these newer recent discoveries. At this point, Columbo starts to think, somebody's not telling us the truth here. What's the real story? Then he starts to wonder why we've got pyramids here in America 
that look almost exactly like the step pyramid in Egypt? Was not Joseph of Israel prime minister of all Egypt? Would he not have taught the arts and sciences of the Egyptians to his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh? He then listens intently to people who try to convince him that the book of Abraham is false. But then he discovers this land of Olashim has been found in the exact place that the book of Abraham describes it to be, a location only known recently, which describes and encompasses all the things that we hear about in the book of Abraham. Now at this point, he is compelled to conclude that it is the many critics who are deliberately being dishonest to maintain a false narrative, no matter what evidence disproves their claims. Therefore, it's the accusers who are lying and not the Mormons. But then Columbo digs even deeper and discovers that these anti-Mormon critics falsified their Egyptologist in order to make it appear that Joseph Smith didn't translate the Book of Abraham. He discovers D.J. Nelson had a false PhD. He now discovers that Nelson obtained his degree in Egyptology through a criminally operated diploma mill. So at this point, Columbo knows that these people are lying. He has a report from the Attorney General. They have resorted to fraud and criminality in order to frame Joseph Smith with pure lies. In the book, Dr. D.J. Nelson translated the book of Abraham and proved that it was not legitimate. Well, we've since learned that D.J. Nelson was not legitimate. D.J. Nelson was not what he cranked up to be, and he was later proven to be a fraud. You got proof of this? I got proof. <clears throat> Over live television with thousands of people watching, I proved to this Christian by showing him documents published by the Attorney General's office that this guy who claimed to translate the Book of Abraham was a false Egyptologist with a fake PhD, and he was caught by the authorities. Well, I was under the understanding that he was a renowned Egyptologist. Um, <laughs> I can't, uh, why would he lie about it? Well, for one thing, we have to look at, at what he was doing. He was making a lot of money doing what he was doing. So now he starts adding things up. How does somebody living in 1830 know about ancient cities made of cement when nobody in 1830 knew how to make anything out of cement? In 1830, people were still riding on horseback, on dirt roads. They didn't know how to make anything like that out of cement. Yet they have discovered now that these ancient people had cement highways and buildings and structures made of cement. The Book of Mormon talks about high towers made of cement. Are we to believe that the Mormon missionaries went down there and built these structures just to make it look like the Mormon church was true? So any clever research man is going to sit there and think, how do you falsify something like that just to make your religion look true? How do you fake a pyramid? And there being but little timber upon the face of the land, nevertheless, the people who went forth became exceedingly expert in the working of cement. Therefore, they did build houses of cement, in which they did dwell. And thus they did enable the people in the land northward that they might build many cities, both of wood and cement. Verse 11. But the identifying essence of the tribe of Joseph is just like Joseph himself. He's missing. He's gone. The cities in the Book of Mormon show up in all the right places. But their history, their language, their roots, everything about them is gone. It's like archaeologists looking for a missing Joseph down in the ground. This biblical type and pattern is consistent with Joseph Smith, who found the Book of Mormon, the tribe of Joseph, in the ground. The Christian religions today are a parallel of the brothers of Joseph of Israel. They're trying to get rid of him, put him back down in the pit, and get him out of the picture. But it's true, sir. As I live, it is true. God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, appeared to me. This is heresy. Oh! And I will hear no more of it. So what are you going to do? Go to court and try to prove to the judge that there's no evidence about the Book of Mormon when they've actually used the Book of Mormon to track down exact locations, even with the right name? Really? Really? You think you're going to take that to court? At the time Joseph Smith received the Book of Abraham, he also received the Book of Joseph. But where is it? It's missing. So here's the important question. Why would the Lord preserve 
a record of Joseph, along with the book of Abraham for thousands and thousands of years, until it finally reaches Joseph Smith in the latter days, and then have him do absolutely nothing with it, in fact lose it. Suppose for a minute that God is trying to tell us something by sending us an ancient scroll of Joseph in Egypt. But then, the scroll becomes invisible to us, and seems to be totally gone or ignored. So you have God revealing to Joseph Smith that this is the book of Joseph, and then nothing happens with it. Here it is, everybody. Now you see it, and now you don't. Or would it make more sense that God did tell Joseph Smith why he sent him this Joseph scroll, telling him to perhaps incorporate it with facsimile too? Why? To demonstrate why the covenant of Abraham in our day is about Joseph's posterity. Joseph being directly in charge of the Abrahamic covenant. Could it be a demonstration of how you use facsimile too to bring Joseph back from the ground, back into the light again? Could the tribe of Joseph be hidden inside a funeral scroll, being brought back, as it were, from the dead? And is it entirely possible that I, Paul Gregerson, have decrypted this message, not by revelation, by decrypting an encrypted message placed in there by Joseph Smith himself, in my new videos, Book of Abraham, Part 2 through 7? Is this not quite a claim to make? Either I can demonstrate this convincingly in a methodical way, or I cannot. Watch me. And so far, not one anti-Mormon has been able to debunk one of my videos online. And to this day in Shechem, the Jews recognize the tomb of Joseph, where his bones are still believed to be contained. So if we add figure 5 here to figure 6, the four corners of the earth and Joseph's sons, it equals 11, which represents the bull who will push Israel together to the ends of the earth. Not happening yet, but when I finish my videos, a proponent has proposed a large reward, somewhere around $5,000, if anyone can publicly prove that my Abraham videos are a manipulated hoax. Right now, $5,000 is proposed. It will be determined by a media source to monitor the unbiased fairness. So far, no one has found any evidence of manipulation. What's actually happening is some of the people who were deceived by the anti-Mormon videos about the Book of Abraham are angry at the anti-Mormons, especially after they found out how my videos exposed the Book of Abraham deceptions seen in their anti-Mormon videos. We have over 50,000 people who have watched my videos, and it's like I pulled back the curtain on a smoke and mirrors magic trick, and everyone watching my videos is seeing exactly how they got tricked by the smoke and the mirrors of the anti-Mormons. I didn't even ask these people to do this, but some of them are personally contacting the anti-Mormon authors about these Abraham videos. Some are even calling them up personally and demanding that they answer Paul Gregerson's videos online. The postings of these heated debates now number in the tens of thousands, and over 50,000 hits, with thousands of people being eyewitnesses to these anti-Mormons biting the dust. According to these guys who are currently posting on my videos, they are saying that these anti-Mormons are absolutely refusing to answer why my videos expose their deceptions, and they are all running away from the challenge of my videos. It certainly seems that these anti-Mormons have walked right into their own trap, and people are going to go to the media and demand that these people answer for it. So we've got three or four more videos, and we're going to be completely done with this thing. And if we offer this cash reward nationwide, these anti-Mormons won't dare come out and answer it, even for a reward, we're going to smoke them all out. What's really going on here is an all-out effort, like unto the liberal media, labeling Joseph Smith a false prophet by spreading a massive propaganda campaign just to get you mad enough to want to lynch a man who's been dead for 180 years already. It took a lot of work for people to doctor up all his prophecies, in their desperate attempt to make all his prophecies look false, actually blatantly lying to you to get you mad enough at a nothing burger. So what is the overall effect and intention of steering millions of Christians away from Joseph Smith? Well, nobody pays attention to where the Bible prophecies talk about the tribe of Joseph going over the great deep to receive America 
as their promised land declared by Moses in Deuteronomy 33. How can millions of Christians be the victims of a Bible cover-up by using mind control to the point that millions are effectively stirred away from the Bible prophecies concerning America? The Bible even describing the Rocky Mountains and the geographical marks, having to go over the ocean in order to get there. Even avoiding where Jesus himself in Matthew explains how his kingdom will be in America and taken away from Judah. I don't think any of the churches today are teaching the truth. You did not hear what you heard, and you did not read what you read. I did not hear what I heard, and I did not read what I read. So if a curious Christian does ask about Joseph's promised land, that it might be in America, what might happen? Is there truth behind the real satanic Jedi mind trick? Nothing to see here, just move along. Suppose that if you are deceived into going into an agreement with these forces of darkness, that you are transformed into an agent of darkness yourself, to fight against Joseph Smith, thinking that you are doing good. For if you fight against Christ's prophet, are you not fighting Christ himself? When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they had laid there for thousands of years. They had fragmented into small tiny pieces like a huge jigsaw puzzle that had to be reassembled, which took decades and years to do. The writing had to be matched, the puzzle pieces had to be exacted into the right order. The scrolls were so faded and weathered, they had to use infrared to even read the writing and put the right pieces together in the right order. Through months and months of dedicated work, they might be lucky to put together one page of reading material. I don't know if anybody can really appreciate the painstaking work it was to put together the Book of Enoch alone, and then let alone translate it. One of the greatest accomplishments from the Dead Sea Scrolls was the recovery of the Book of the Giants and the Book of Enoch. This book was gone from the ancient world, and no other copy exists on earth or ever was found, especially the story of Mahijah, the story of a man who followed Enoch around and had a unique relationship with Enoch. No one ever heard of this man, even from the Bible. There are highly unique and specific details in the conversation of the text between Mahijah and Enoch, and no scholar on the earth knew that these things existed until the Dead Sea Scrolls were translated. The most shocking and amazing truth came when we compared Joseph Smith's revelation about Enoch being the same text and even the same conversation between Mahijah and Enoch, even the name Mahijah and his mission, and even Mahijah asking Enoch the very same questions as seen in the Dead Sea Scrolls. According to the famous Yale professor, Jewish literary scholar Harold Bloom, who was a non-Mormon, he found Joseph Smith's ability to write this ancient text remarkable. He said he found an enormous validity to capture archaic elements of the ancient Jewish religion that had ceased to be available and was highly unlikely to have been touched by Joseph Smith in the 1830s. So the fact that Joseph Smith just came up with all of this material by his imagination and then had it accidentally match with much later discoveries in ancient texts is impossible. We're talking about material that had to be discovered by non-Mormons in the Dead Sea Scrolls over a hundred years later. That's impossible. So these facts, and many other facts, are what anti-Mormons do not tell you. The deliberate deceit by enemies of the church to concoct false narratives by ignoring real evidence or changing that evidence by making deliberate omissions to make you think that Joseph Smith is a false prophet. This is the kind of behavior that fits a profile of someone using Freudian projection and transference by inventing deliberate biases to hide all the truth. It's the very same liberal tactics called yellow journalism to create problems that really aren't there. Critics also seek to alarm many, many people about the statement of Joseph Smith where he appears to be boasting that he would do a greater work than Jesus Christ. But if you honestly examine the context, Joseph was mimicking Paul for the things that he boasted of because of Jesus Christ. The greatest work and commission of Jesus Christ himself to the apostles was to take the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The apostles could not do that. They did not have jet airplanes. 
Today, the Latter-day Church is taking the gospel to all nations. Therefore, Jesus is talking about the latter days, when the gospel goes forth to all the earth. So, is Joseph Smith really out of line when he declares that he will do a greater work than Jesus and the apostles did? Or, is he fulfilling a prophecy by Jesus himself? For Jesus himself said, He that believeth on me, the works I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father, John 14 and 12. Thereby every Christian knows that the greatest work that will ever take place is in the latter days. That is the work that will bring about the coming of Christ and the gathering of the saints. So the anti-Mormons hope that you will ignore the fact that everywhere Joseph declares that the only reason he was able to do this greater work is because Jesus Christ in heaven is empowering him to do it. The LDS critics exploit Alma 7.10 in the Book of Mormon. It gives a prophecy that Jesus Christ would be born at Jerusalem, not in Jerusalem, but at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers. Now, of course, this is talking about the land of Jerusalem, which encompassed all those areas, including Bethlehem, which was only five miles away from the city of Jerusalem. This becomes what I call a pretended gotcha. Gotcha, Joseph Smith. You said that Jesus was born in Jerusalem when we know, we all know, that he was born in Bethlehem. It's just as silly as saying, you're a liar because you said you were born in Massachusetts, when we all know you were born in Boston. I actually feel sorry for Christians out there because these people actually figure that you're actually stupid, that you know nothing about your Bible. Therefore, they can tell you how to think. I mean, it's really sad. They figure that the average Christian is lazy, he doesn't know anything about his Bible. He's not going to look it up and find out that there are many places in the Bible that verify the very thing that the Book of Mormon is saying. Here we have in the Bible this Amaziah who was buried at Jerusalem with the fathers in the city of David, which is Bethlehem. Here's a guy getting buried at Bethlehem at Jerusalem. So it's talking about at the area of Jerusalem, the land of Jerusalem. It's not talking about the city of Jerusalem. But they figure that you're stupid. It's terrible. I mean, they actually hoodwink people to think that they've actually got one over on the Mormons here. But in actuality, they are the ones deceived. Do you really think that's evidence of a false prophecy that would hold up in a court? So anybody foolish enough to think that they could take this into a court case would lose. Quite a bit made about allegations that Joseph Smith married a 14-year-old on the internet. Half of it turns out to not be true. What is true, however, is Helen R. Kimball's father approved of his daughter being sealed to Joseph Smith for the next life. One of the reasons there is no evidence of this ever being a consummated earthly marriage came to light when the court conflicts arose between the reorganized church and the LDS church after Joseph Smith died. And the legal wives of Joseph Smith had to testify. Helen R. Kimball was not there. She was never a part of any earthly marriage arrangements. I guarantee you, regardless of what you're hearing on the internet, there's somebody like a historian that knows a lot more about this than the person you've been listening to on the internet. Another point of internet controversy turns out to be Fanny Alger, who supposedly was 17 years old, who turns out to actually be 19. The controversy on the internet is all about Joseph Smith having an affair with this girl. However, Fanny's family recognized this as a real marriage. If it had been adultery, there would have been a problem with her family. Meanwhile, Eliza Snow moved into the Joseph Smith home to teach the children. She wrote a paper listing Fanny as one of the wives of Joseph Smith. Of course, the true historical accounts directly conflict with the anti-Mormon accounts. Fanny's family believed it was an actual marriage. The other family she lived with, Conse Webb and Elijah Webb, said it was a real marriage. As I documented scripturally with my video number six, Joseph Smith was commanded to enter into these kinds of marriages before he could reveal it to many in the church who were not ready to hear about it or accept it. This obviously included Oliver Cowdery, who made a real stink about this before he understood it. The anti-Mormon critics hope that you don't know very much about the early statistics of the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, whereby women got married as teenagers. 
Back then it was commonplace for famous people and even presidents of the United States or famous people like Edgar Allan Poe to marry teenage girls. Edgar Allan Poe married a 13-year-old girl and nobody ever said anything about it. In those days, the thing they thought was immoral and bad was if a girl got pregnant out of wedlock. I guarantee you, older men marrying teenage girls was never considered pedophilia. Even in biblical times, women got married at the age of 15. The mother of Jesus, Mary, was 15 years old. Today, I hope to expose a mass cover-up that almost perfectly parallels what we see in the news in 2018. A concerted effort to frame someone with a false crime in order to hide a secret crime from being discovered and exposed. It is my opinion that the very same diversionary tactics are being used to falsely darken the LDS Church's image today. LDS author Brian Hales hired a professional historian who was a non-Mormon non-believer in the church. This professional historian was named Don Bradley. He obtained every record he requested about polygamy by simply requesting them or any other church record regarding historical topics to his surprise. He simply found no LDS historical cover-ups like the critics spread so widely today. To the surprise of some, they found no evidence of Joseph Smith stealing other men's wives in church history. Sifting through countless records, they found no husbands, including non-LDS husbands, ever mentioning or complaining once about Joseph Smith stealing their wife. If any such accusations were true, it would always come out later with the kids. In this case, they found no children complaining that Joseph Smith stole their mother from their dad or broke up their family. Today, this many years later, you could count hundreds or even thousands of kids. It simply never happened historically. Today, through extensive DNA tests, they have proved that only one child thought to be Joseph Smith's, Sylvia Lyons, was recently proved by DNA testing not to be Joseph Smith's daughter. Like Father Abraham, Joseph Smith did have polygamous wives, but the marriages thought to be polyandrous were ceilings and marriages that only took place after everyone was dead and were not for this life. During Don's specialized and professional research, he obtained a spiritual testimony that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and Don recently was baptized. He learned that the critics project onto Joseph Smith their own sense of human nature. Sifting through countless county and city records and church records, those people in Nauvoo who actually knew Joseph Smith personally did not see what those who know him least today claim to know. The truth actually is a professional historian was converted to the LDS Church while researching that same church history that the critics say is so dangerous for the members of the church to learn about. So somebody gets a hold of me the other day and says, Paul, you're completely wrong. There is one husband that the prophet stole from who had a perfect marriage to Zina Huntington. She and Henry Jacobs were inseparable. Well, this person was deceived by an anti-Mormon source. So it turns out when you get the whole story that Zina Huntington declared in a public statement that her marriage to Henry was very unhappy and they parted ways. So people really need to stop reading the tabloid falsehoods that are put out by the anti-Mormons and read Brian Hale's account where you get all the facts. Like Father Abraham, Joseph Smith did have polygamous wives, but the marriages thought to be polyandrous were ceilings and marriages that only took place after everyone was dead and were not for this life. Own ordinances, you know, man limits himself when he doesn't follow Jesus Christ, and that's really the, the simple truth. Okay, the Bible says nothing about eternal marriage. Luke says there will be no marriage in heaven. How do you get away with eternal okay. marriages? Luke doesn't, does not say that there's no marriages in heaven. And I'll show you why here, looking over at this chart. In Luke, it talks about a situation where a woman was married to a man, and this man died. Was, uh, his brother was to take his place on earth. Okay. Now, these Pharisees came to Jesus and Sadducees and said, Jesus, how is this going to work? If, uh, if a man die and his brother takes his wife for his wife, 
and uh, then he dies, and then the next brother takes her for a wife, then let's say seven brothers die, all of them die, and all of them had her. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Well, of course, the, the question, whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection, is kind of silly, because in the resurrection there will be no marriage. Uh, there also will be no baptism. There's not going to be any church ordinances in the, in the resurrection. All of those things are earthly works that have to be done before. And so here's the crux of the whole matter. He says that uh, Luke says in here that the Sadducee says, that, and the children that these brothers have, the first man had no children, the children that these brothers had with this wife will be unto the first husband. They will be raised unto the first husband. Every one of them, no matter how many children that these brothers have with this woman, they're all going to be raised unto the name and unto the first husband. So when they die, uh, they're connected to the first husband. So last of all, the last husband dies, the wife dies also. Whose wife will she be? The, the scripture really answers itself. Here's her whole family up here. The first husband receives all of the children. He would also uh, receive the wife. And this is proven by this scripture here, where it says, Neither is the man without the woman in the Lord. Uh, when you go before the Lord, you're not going to go alone. You have to go with the woman. It says in 1 Corinthians 11.11. 11. And so, really, people just don't stop and think about the scripture, how it functions. And the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection in the first place, so Christ answered them in the light of their own knowledge. And so what we have here is a situation where the family unit is eternal. And even in uh, Mark 10 and 7 through 9, and they, they twain, two people shall become one flesh. No more twain. They're not going to be two people anymore, but they're going to become one. And so would God break up a faithful marriage? Now you think about this for a minute. A man who raises, or marries a woman that he loves, is he going to give up on her uh, when he's dead or she's dead? Especially if he had children with her and he knocked himself out going to college, gaining a career, sweating blood for that family. Would the Lord say to him, well, you've been a faithful brother and you've been a faithful sister, but I'm going to have to divorce you now that you're dead. What kind of a God would reward a faithful marriage that way?